Hello, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining my talk. I know this is probably a bit of a difficult time, so kind of after lunch um, and everything feels a bit heavier. Same, same for me. Um, yeah, it's one of the few English talks. Thanks for, for joining this. I like when I saw the announcement of this talk on Twitter and everything was written in French, my friends started joking if I would not be able to give the talk here in, in French, but I think that would be a disaster for both of us. So I'm, I'll, I'll try to do it in English as good as I can. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, um, I hope somebody can help uh, translate and everything. Now, um, yeah, before I start, just a quick introduction. That's me, even if you don't believe it. That's what I looked like prior to the corona break. Now the hair got a little longer. I work for a small company, a consulting company in Germany called Novatec. We do like custom software and implementation with modern software architectures, cloud native based solutions um, for uh, various customers. And of course, container technology plays a, a key role in that. Now, I've done this talk a couple of times before. I, sometimes I also do this as a, as a lab where people can walk through the different steps that I do and, and, and play with the various options. I'm going to show you this slide again at the end. So um, if, you, if you feel like um, you want to try this yourself at home, um, you can do it from pretty much everywhere where you have like a container environment. All right, so let's start. Um, what I'm going to try to um, elaborate on today are various options for this scenario. That's some developer um, has code and would like to get this code into a runnable container image. There are various options. There are also more options than the ones that you can see here. So when people talk about containers, they, of course, in the first place, think about Docker and building Docker images is normally being done using, using Docker files. So we're going to have a bit of a look on that. What are the various options there and how can I improve um, Docker files in order to build efficient if images? with a bit of a stronger focus to JVM-based containers, um, but also we, we're going to look into other ones as well. Then we're going to look at two other technologies. One is called CHIP. This one is from Google, which is basically only focused on JVM environments. And then there is build packs um, with an implementation called Paketo, which also builds images for, um, for various programming languages. And as I just mentioned, I don't have it on the slides, but I'm also going to maybe show a few things about the Red Hat source to image option. As I said, the list will probably never be complete, but um, I think with this talk, you should be able to get a, an idea of what the various options are and where you want to like, put your emphasis on. So how, how did I get to do this talk? Um, a colleague of mine came to me and said, like, yeah, Matthias, you've been playing with containers quite a bit they're going to have some requirements in their project as well. So what is like the best base container image? And being a consultant, what would I, of course, answer? It depends, right? Um, because, yeah, there are options. So before I go deeper into that, um, I just want to do a bit of a recap to say, to get everybody on the same page and say, okay, what is a container image? What is a container? Why we are we doing this? And in the end, then for go into a direction, how can I improve the container build? Um, to, take, um, to take the best uh, efforts out of it. So, yeah, this is something that I would expect everyone to be familiar with. If you run a process or an application, an operating system, this very often depends on libraries and dependencies. And one of the ideas of containers is to make this kind of process and application portable. In order to do that, uh, containers basically try right, to separate the process and all the underlying process and libraries that it depends on and bundles this with them. Now, container did actually not get invented with the rise of Docker. Um, Docker was, uh, there, there were technologies underlying um, Linux technologies like namespaces, chain root, and C groups before that kind of built the fundament for pretty much all container technologies. So they would isolate a process so that people like other processes cannot see this process in the operating system. They would give a certain root directory and they would specify how much resources can this, um, can this process basically take. Um, so if you're good in Linux, you don't need Docker. You can do all that by yourself. However, this is the spot kind of, kind of Docker hit and said, well, we provide a kind of a friendly API 
um, to shield the users from all that complexity. So that I can just say docker pull, docker run, and, and, those, and those things would work. So that's kind of the kind of common understanding I expect everybody kind of has. Now, we want to look at container images. And as we understood what a container is, then an image is basically a template to run those, con uh, a container image is a template to run those containers. Um, it packages and bundles everything that it needs, and then you can send it to a container daemon, and they will be able to handle it and, and run it for you. And this is pretty much the strong point, that it works pr the same way wherever you have those container daemons. Now, if you take a closer look on how those images are being built up internally. They don't come as like a big blob that you just like download and extract on your file system and run. They are separated into so-called layers. And with this layer, the container daemon is able to identify, oh, I, I've seen those layers in other containers before, so I don't need to download them only once. Um, and that, in that case, it can make the container daemon more effective that it doesn't have to download the same things over and over again. So in the very beginning, to construct those layers, you would basically have to start and run an image, um, then work in that existing container, for example, installing a Java runtime, then doing a commit, which is basically snapshotting a container into like an, an image format and then run it again and like basically stack one layer over the next one. This is what it was like very briefly in the beginning, but then Docker also realized that this is probably no, not the most elegant way of doing that. Nevertheless, it's important to understand that this layered structure exists because that's one of the, the points where you can actually start to make improvements and say, well, I want to build my image differently to be more efficient. We're going to see more on that later. Now, Docker came in and said, well, we're going to create this thing called a Docker file. Um, I think Docker was released in March 2013 and in May 2013, this is the first time it appeared in the, in the history on, um, or in the Git log. So you could potentially say it's pretty much always been there. The Docker file works in, the, in a similar way. It's like a, a batch file that processes those steps that we've seen before with that run and commit exchange. So each step in that file here would later on result in one layer of the container image. So you get a base operating system, you install your Java stuff, then it's basically the, the, the part that differentiates your container from all the other containers in the world is where you copy your application inside. And then you basically wrap it with a command to say whenever somebody executes that container, this copied jar file will be run with the Java runtime that I've installed before. And now, if you do that, you will probably find there is not only one solution. Um, these this is like a generic base image for only operating system binaries. There are also specified base images that provide um, like operating system and Java stuff combined. And, and the, if you start searching, you will see there are more and more. And that's kind of where my colleague came in and say, well, which of the ones should I take? And that's, of course, an, an interesting question, because when you run such a Docker file, you kind of rely on those base images. As a developer, it, you're basically expected to say, please deliver a container uh, that runs your application code. And then with this, you build it, you run it mentality, it's like everything which is in the container is under your responsibility. So I doubt that many of the developers know about all the binaries and libraries that they pull in with those, um, with those initial base images. And that's why you need to take a bit of a careful look on that. So um, I'm going to, get to go deeper into that in a second. So what I also said, like, how do you use that base container image? So where, where, do, you, where do you apply that in your kind of development workflow? So nowadays, a lot of people use container orchestration systems like Kubernetes. And um, also a lot of people use like CI, CD pipelines to automate their entire chain coming from source code, building, testing the code, packaging into container, and then run on a target environment. So the scope of the Docker file normally is the part where you containerize the application. The task, however, is, of course, in such a pipeline, 
to standardize steps, to make them repeatable and consistent, that whenever you execute them, they always will behave the same. So it might, of course, sound logic to say, well, the, the build mechanism is also something that I want to have consistent and like behaving the same way all the time. So if you would want to include that in your Docker file, then of course the layers would get more. So you would have installed the build tools, copy the source, build the source, then of course remove the build tools again, because the image is of course supposed to be as small as possible, install the runtime and configure everything. Docker also realized that and came up with an approach which is called multi-stage container images. So these are kind of they kind of work the same way as a standard Docker file, but you can see, and I tried to color this a little, in like individual sections. So one section that I have here on top, or it's like stage, um, because it's called multi-stage, is where you actually pull in the source code and then build the source code. So the result of that stage is only the, the char file that you're going to execute in the end. And then you have a second stage right here, um, where you actually build the run part. So you, 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 in, in this case, you pull in the base Java image and copy over the char file which has been built there. So the advantage, of course, of that is that everybody that runs that file on wherever they are, it will always behave the same way because they will always have the same build environment and they will always result in the same run image. So that's, of course, a lot better if people start building the code on their machine and then check in the char files or whatsoever. So with that, you can, of course, in increase the consistency and like the re repeatability factor. Now, one of the downsides of that is, and I'm not sure if you have, have done that, if you start a new image and, and, and run that image, of course, this image is like runs for the first time in the world. And if you do like a Maven, uh, build or package or whatever for the first time, then there's no cache. Um, and of course, this step will always appear to download the entire internet because it needs to download all the other packages that your application needs. That's the price you probably have to pay, but then you know it's still it's always going to be the same. Now, Docker also saw this and continued the evolution of of building images with a technology called BuildKit, which is nowadays, I think, the standard uh, when you install Docker. In the previous times, you had to enable it um, um, with a command line flag. And this one, of course, tried to address all the learnings that have been made in, in the couple of years using those containers. So to say, make the builds faster, make the images smaller, um, improve the caching, improve the security, and also provide some flow logic and um, kind of turn the Docker file a bit into like a programming language where you can then say, well, if I have multiple stages, like here, for example, where I build a base image and then another one where I build the, the base build image, so to say, if they don't depend on each other, then Docker will be smart enough to say I can run them in parallel and save some time. And also I can set like flags and do an if then else, if though if this happens, we're gonna skip that stage and, and so on. So this can of course be helpful. In turn, that can also of course add complexity that you might not need. So I, I, to be honest, I don't really use that that much. I'm still more likely to be doing two or three stages at the most. If it's getting more complex than that, then there also might be something wrong with the application if it needs that kind of, um, whatever complex structured build process. Another thing that BuildKit brought in was that so-called front-end images. So with this one, you can define which kind of Docker file version are you actually going to use. So you can make, make sure that if multiple of, the, of your team members using uh, that mechanism, that they're also using um, the same version. So in this type, I specified 1.3. Um, of course, you can omit that, then Docker will have a default, but that's basically the same thing as if you use latest images. They will update whenever Docker thinks it's right, and you never know, and never know for sure um, which is the one that you're currently using. So with this, you can specify, and the, f the features that you have in the Docker file will basically result out of the front-end image that you, ba that you initially tag. 
So that also gives you the possibility to use front-end images that have functionality, which is not included in the mainstream um, or in the standard settings of, um, of your current Docker environment. This is something I had to do uh, for a while to actually enable that caching mechanism. So you're probably aware that when you use Docker containers, you can like outsource things into the file system and, 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 and share volumes um, across multiple containers. This was never possible with Docker files. So with, within, within the process of a Docker file, you couldn't mount anything and like re-invoke that or claim that in a, in a consecutive iteration of, of, of the processing. Now this has changed um, and nowadays it's, I think since Docker file version 1.2, you have this um, included as a standard. And that, of course, means you can do the same thing as before, build like a stage where you build your code, and then put all the downloaded libraries into that cache file. And when you rerun the Docker file, this, um, this cached mechanism will get picked up and can, of course, tremendously speed up your, um, your, your build process. All right. So. Yeah, we still haven't answered the question what the best Java base image is, but we get kind of a bit of understanding what makes such a container image good. So what can I say, which are criteria where I would say if my container image is built like this and that way, then I would rather use it than with other settings. So of course we have seen speed, fast image builds, then size, having them small so they can be loaded quickly, structuring with layers, a high degree of standardization. What's obviously missing here is security. Security is also uh, an important factor. Um, so all of those things I can tweak and turn to make my container image better. Now, what I hear very often is that people try to improve very much on the factor of size, like getting the image as small as possible so Docker doesn't have to load so many things and that might slow down the system. This is actually not entirely true because the way a Docker daemon works or a container daemon in general, they will load all the layers and cache all the layers. So if you load a, a similar file again, or let's say you build a new version of your Java application and have the same build process, then Docker does not have to reload all of the layers. So it's only just going to be the top layer where your application code is contained. So normally it's going to be a base operating system layer, then many dependency layers, and then the application layer on top. Where in the most cases you should have the scenario that the, the top layer changes pretty much with every build. The dependency layer would only change if you change dependencies, and the base OS layer shouldn't change with every build. So if you have that, then you might be doing something wrong. Now, if we know that only the top layer is the one that has those updates and that have to be reloaded, it might make more sense to have a closer look on that, especially when it comes to, to Java applications. So in the example we had before, I just copied in the entire char file in one step. And um, that resulted in that top layer containing that char file. In the end, a char file has, of course, a structure in itself. So there are class files, there are also resource files, and dependency chars. And of course, the same mechanism applies here. Your class files will probably change more often if you, uh, if you commit your code often and you, and you build very often. The resource and the dependency chars will probably not change so often. Now, you can also apply that in, that in, your, um, in your Docker file. So instead of copying the entire char over, you can basically decompose the jar file into like a directory of dependencies. I mean, this is a Spring Boot example with a Spring Boot loader, snapshot dependencies, and the application. So in case only your code changes, then it's only going to be that layer that has to be exchanged. So instead of manually squeezing out the on one or the other megabyte on your base image, I would much rather recommend you to take that approach because then it's, this is the only delta that the Docker daemon has to load. So with that, we can, we can most likely see, uh, at least from my experience, as good as you can get with, with Docker files. So you have caching, you have 
pretty good structure. You have separation of build and run, and um, everything is very well standardized. So before um, I go into other options, is there anything, any questions on that Docker part so far? All right, good. So yeah, I said the Docker file is probably the one which most people use and are familiar with. Now, there is more. And most of you probably know that Docker was not the first container technology which was out there. Um, there were, like, that you don't even see on that time diagram, there were Linux containers in the first place. They kind of worked in a very similar way as Docker, but never became so popular. And the container technology was also used inside of platforms. I mean, Google uses it inside. Then there were very initially in the cloud, there were like some pass approaches, platform as a service with Heroku and Cloud Foundry. And they kind of, they, they used containers, but they did never expose the container building and handling mechanism to the developer. So um, this was handled inside of the platform. Nevertheless, those technologies kept on developing things. And now with the popularity of Docker and Kubernetes in particular, the requirement for a standardized container build mechanism, of course, became obvious. So this build pack idea, which I'm going to explain a little later, also made it their way outside of the past platforms and can now be used as a st in a standalone mode. So you have that mechanism that the pass would use internally this, this one is called the Cloud Native Build Packs. It's a CNCF project. It's open source. Everyone can use it. So we're going to have a look on that. Another evolution um, people could see was with the Spotify Docker Maven plugin. So instead of doing a code build and a container build, with that plugin it was possible to basically invoke Maven and not only get the char file, but only get, also get the containerized char file. Um, there is this Google chip component that also is, is lever leveraging that functionality. There is also Podman, uh, there is a source to image from, from Red Hat, that, which is not on that slide. Um, normally, my talk is not an hour, so I had to make a bit of sacrifices. So this has no, no sake for completeness. Um, but yeah. I, my primary goal is here not to, to sell you one or the other technology, just basically to make you aware um, that that Dockerfile is most likely not the only option. Now, let's have a look at chip first. So, if you're not within the Java or JVM world, you can start to fade out for the next five minutes because that's mostly about Java things. However, from what I've seen from the talks here in the conference, there's, uh, it's, they, they, the JVM stuff is definitely kind of dominating. So that might be interesting for, um, for some of you. Now, this is how chip works. It's actually very simple. Um, so you basically have some Java code, and then you invo invoke Maven or Gradle um, using this chip plugin and this will result in a container image. The interesting thing on this slide is actually what you don't see, uh, or which might not be obvious to you in the first place, because I've written here only local operating system. So what chip does not need, I'm not sure if you can read it, it does not need a container daemon. So if you use Docker files, of course, they will rely on a container daemon to build your images. Same will apply for the build packs later on. Chip doesn't need that. So Chip can basically construct all those layers and put it out onto the file system without using any, um, any daemon. This might be an advantage, uh, especially if you use it some kind, in some kind of build pipelines, where I've seen people having restrictions of installing a Docker daemon on build nodes for whatever security reasons. Then in that case, this will definitely be a, a bit of a help. Now, in the end, it's like the question of, okay, where can you build your container image to? Um, you can directly expose it, like push it to a container registry, like the Docker Hub or any one of your Quay or any one of your own ones. You can export it as a tar file 
And you can, of course, also export it to your local, uh, or build it against your local daemon. So um, the fact that you don't need it doesn't mean you cannot use it. Um, so there are the three options. And then if you build it against the local daemon, it will end up in your like, local container registry. And that thing I talked about before, um, like things changing more often on top than on the bottom, both in the container and also in the Java land. Um, this is basically built in to chip automatically. So you don't have to decompose a char file or do any additional manual steps to say, OK, I'm going to split into like class files, resource files, or um, underlying dependency chars. All right, so I'm going to drink something real quick. All right, so now we're going to look at the cloud native build packs. This is, yeah, as I said, a technology which has been around for quite a while, but only been like outsourced, how to say, or released as a standalone tooling um, a couple of years ago. So the general way of how a build pack would work, and this is coming from a company called Heroku, who was pretty much, I think, the first public platform as a service provider in the cloud, which kind of the claim, you give us your source code and we build and run and scale and do everything with it that you want to have. So basically, you don't have to worry about everything, about anything. Of course, in order to do that, um, it has to have a detection mechanism to find out, is this a Java, is this a Go, is this a Ruby or whatever source code. Once it has detected that, it was able to build it and export it into a runnable artifact. At that time, it wasn't called container or container image, but that runnable artifact would, of course, be the, the, the thing that we're going to call container image today. So from a history perspective, Heroku came up with that idea and used it in its own commercial platform and kept on developing it. Then Cloud Foundry took over that idea for the Cloud Foundry open source um, environment and, all the, of course, all the commercial Cloud Foundry platforms. And now, and after that is kind of the time when Docker and Kubernetes became really popular. So there was more demand of having that um, outside of your platform. And then the Cloud Native Build Packs came up with like a reference implementation or definition or say, okay, this is what things need to do uh, in order to be called a cloud native build pack. And then there is Paketo as one implementation of that specification. There are others. Google provides some of them. Uh, Heroku provides them. Paketo is basically the open source project out of coming out of Cloud Foundry. So you can use that um, and basically take benefit of all the um, experience Cloud Foundry has made internally. Now, how does that work? Um, as said before, in, in kind of contrast to, to chip, the build packs require a container daemon. So they come along with an own CLI, uh, like many other tools. So you basically provide your source code and then say pack in that directory and specify the name of the image that you want to have. As a next step, um, the pack mechanism will reach out to the Docker Hub and download this so-called builder image. That's basically your build packs mechanism along with all the build packs inside. Then it will analyze your code and do the same thing and say, is this a Go application or Rust or Ruby or Python or whatsoever? And then it collects all the necessary build tools in order to transform that into a container image which will then result in your local container daemon as well. So this is a generic approach which works for multiple um, programming languages. And um, that, of course, gives you the possibility, even if you don't know, or like, if you, or like to, to, to take a general approach. Nowadays, a lot of the implementations of microservices and distributed systems are polyglot. So it's not like that you have one framework and one Java version that everybody has to use. So you might have many. And that means you can have like one mechanism to apply for multiple different frameworks. And that in, 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 and hence increase your degree of, of consistency. 
Another thing that this technology brings in is the so-called rebasing mechanism. So I told you before that most often container images will change their content on the top and not on the bottom. Now I'm telling you all the other way around. So what happens in case you need to exchange something in your base image, but actually you, did, you do not need your, to update your application layers because maybe there was just no code change. Um, this is a possibility that you can do using that build packs mechanism. Now the question is why would you want to do that? Um, th probably the number one answer is security. Um, because of course you might, you will all have heard about that lock for j vulnerability or that shell shock and heart bleed vulnerability in the past. Um, that normally is not happening here on your application layer, but further down on your dependency or, or base operating system layers. So, so with that, you can basically apply that mechanism and all the top layers will basically be taken over and just the underlying layer will be exchanged and you get a new image with a patched uh, base layer version. Now, this will probably not make a whole lot of sense if you only have one application image. But if you have many, and if you have many that have different base layers, different base container images, different frameworks, then this can start to make sense. Like I think there was a, um, I was a survey in um, a car manufacturer in Germany that when they asked how many different operating systems and patch levels and everything do you have across your data center? Not only in containers, um, but pretty much everywhere. And the result was about several hundred. Of course, not several hundred different operating systems, but several different versions and different levels. And now imagine overnight there is that news that comes out to say, yeah, there is this heartbleed vulnerability. So what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to check am I affected? And where am I affected? And then you probably have to walk around to all 500 versions of your operating systems and see, is that library e exploit happening in this case, or is it not? If you use that mechanism for all your containers, and this is also what Cloud Foundry did. Cloud Foundry had exactly one base image for every um, application container. So they would immediately know, is this affected or is it not? And if it is, then you would exchange all the base images. And if it's not, you can just like, continue and be happy with what you have. And the more you use this technology for a, a wider sense, then of course you can do the same thing outside of a platform as a service and say, yeah, is my base image affected? Yes, then okay, do a rebase of all the images and, and, and redeploy them. If they're not, I can be happy. I mean, yeah, it doesn't happen very often, but once it, once it, when it happens, um, of course, people are really happy that such a mechanism exists. Now, coming kind of to an end soon with those slides, we have Paketo, as I said, as one implementation of that build pack technology. So basically what it provides is um, a set of runtime and languages support that it can handle. So um, I'm not sure if this screenshot is still the latest state of the art, but that's, I think, when I did the slides. So if you have those technologies within your um, distributed application, then you could use that build pack mechanism for all of them. And of course, as I said before, if you have multi different ones, then this rebase mechanism kind of comes to make somewhat more sense. All right. So from a flow perspective, this is under, under the same specification as, um, as what I've shown before. So you can invoke pack and then it downloads that builder image and constructs um, a resulting image. In case if you have a Java application or any Java framework, this will also have that mechanism included for, to have in the resulting image 
the separation between class, resource, and, and dependency chars. So you also get this kind of out of the box here. If you even have, uh, if you happen to have a Spring Boot application, then there is also a Maven or Gradle plugin that you don't need to run pack, and you just can invoke it via Maven and Gradle and invoke the same mechanism. So Maven and Gradle will then download the latest builder image and, and build that component. All right. Um, so, yeah, I, I still haven't answered that. Um, and I, to be honest, I never really answered it from, to my colleague as well, because I don't think there is a clear answer to say, yeah, you need to use Adopt OpenJDK 11 in that version because that's the best. Um, the question is way more often, like, who owns the image? Who is responsible for that image? Who is going to be called if something goes wrong in the image, which is not a part of the application that developer provides? Um, or in the other words, let's say, who owns the build process? I think it's a very dangerous scenario just to like, let developers walk free and give them the task to say, yeah, build your image to run your code um, and don't allow them enough time to basically examine and scan what might be happening in the base levels of their, of their containers. Now, I've, I of course seen, have, have seen other solutions like where people have an internal container registry for an own company and say, well, we have a dedicated team that maintains the images. They scan them, they know they are, um, they are clean, they are good to handle. And from this set of images, all the developers can pick and choose. Then they're absolutely fine. And I said, well, pick one of these, which is your Java, right Java version. And you, have, you don't have the responsibility on yourself um, to, check, to check that in and, and use it. So this is kind of the consideration that I um, wanted to bring up here. Now, um, I have a bit of time left, so I will try to show a couple of those things live that we have just seen in the, um, in the slide deck. Or are there any questions up to now? All right, so as I said, I'm, I'm gonna share the slides, of course, with the, with the conference, so you're gonna get this link. Um, let me just see where we are. So, if you ever happen to have that link, it's also pinned to my profile here, then you have like kind of a lab walkthrough that you can do yourself. Um, it requires to have, of course, a Docker installation, and then you can do various versions of Docker files, the chip command, and then see, yeah, how does this look like, how does this result, and so on. I think I have that one also. Probably too many windows open. Give me a second. All right. Right now, I am in this directory, and I have a very... Oh, okay. Thanks. Thanks for pointing that out. So now we don't, you don't see anything and I don't see anything either. Okay. It's at least it's consistent. Now so I'm, this is good. So now you can see all the things you shouldn't see. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to re restart from where I just started. So you're going to get that link. I have pinned this kind of lab or walkthrough to my, to my GitHub page. And from there, you can do like the various walkthrough steps with classic Docker files, multi-stage, build kit, chip, build packs, and so on. Um, so I'm going to show a few right now to, to basically show you how that works. Uh, so we can have a quick look at the code. In there, you will find a very simple Java application from, um, that just basically exposes a... Um, it's a, like a REST controller and exposes a, a couple of get mappings that will do something but not necessarily the very sophisticated business logic in there. Um, the only thing is I'm, I'm going to build it, I'm going to modify it a little, and then see how the various files would react. So I don't think I'm going to go in and do the very plain Docker files, or maybe I can do one. So, so let's have a look. 
for example, add that adopt open JDK. And if I do docker build, then you probably have seen this before, then it's going to download. Um, well, the way it shows right here, um, it's already using that build kit stuff. Anyway, so I've just built that image, um, which is the one right here, 10 seconds ago. Is it big enough? I can increase that. Ah, okay. Thanks, thanks a lot. So, yeah, you didn't miss much here on the left-hand side, um, but now it looks a lot better. So, if you look, um, for example, go into the history of that image that I have just built. So, this is the one right here. I'm just taking that image ID right here and look at it. So, you can see that this is the way the image has been built up. So, it has a base image right here. Somebody installed um, updates to the operating system. Here, somebody added Java. And this 19.4 megabyte is basically the char file that we copied in here. So, the, I've built the code before. I can, of course, build it again. But you, from that perspective, you can see you kind of need to rebuild the code. Um, if you want to do that. And now we're going to look at some more advanced thing like that multi-stage. So this is the multi-stage builder. Where you can see I'm going to split. First I'm going to do the, the Maven build part and then I'm going to put that into a, um, into a, a run image. So... It's kind of, it's kind of. If I make stupid movements here, it's because like my notebook is so so low down here. Um, okay, so this was cached before. I probably should delete it. That you believe me. Um, So I'm going to run that one again. OK, so where did it take that cache from? <laughs> That's, of course, some kind of a demo effect, I think. Um, well, anyway, uh, I can trick the cache. And I say, well, I'm going to change the application now. So I'm making tremendous changes to the logic, um, just to make sure it has to rebuild again. And if I do that now, it won't be able to use all the cache. And now we're going to come into that point and say, it feels like it's running for the first time, and it has to download everything from, uh, from Maven. And that's something you would probably have to do all, all the time over and over again. If you do it within a pipeline, it probably doesn't matter so much. If you do that for your local development, um, it can be quite painful at times. So. Depend. I think my connection here is pretty stable, so thanks for, for the one that gave me that cable connection. Yeah, I was, I was worried when I tried that with the conference Wi-Fi before. That would have taken more than the 18 minutes that we have left. So, yeah, we've built that. And whenever I change something, um, I would probably have to wait that entire thing again. So I just removed one character, um, but and it caches like the build image, but it, um, it doesn't cache the build process. So I'm, I'm going to break that. Now, I'm, using, I'm going to use the, um, the multi-stage cache one now, the one right here, that uses that front-end file and mounts this cache component. So... If I invoke this now, it's probably going to detect that it has been built before. And now when it comes to that point, it doesn't download all the things. So it only compiles the changes, um, which, of course, makes that build process a lot quicker. So it, of course, rebuilds the code and uh, packages everything. Um, but yeah. So if we look into the resulting images, I can still see this works well, but 
we're still at the point that where we have that 19.4, 19.6, whatever um, char size as one layer in the code. So we can improve that by using that layered approach where this is in extracted in the in into individual layers. So I'm going to do that. And now it, you can see that execution right here. So I have this, uh, this thing split. And if I look into my images, then I will see one for C that this has been split apart. So look at those top layers right here. And here you can see an interesting thing. From that 19.6 megabyte, there was actually 19.5 megabytes, which was only dependency chars. So only a few kilobytes were actually the classes that have changed. And if I, yeah, if I change something in the code now and rebuild that, then the same thing would apply that only this layer on top here will be exchanged and go into the new image. And if I push that like to a Kubernetes cluster or deploy it in a Kubernetes cluster or to, to wherever, run it on the Docker daemon, then they will only have to exchange that, that small layer and that will probably speed up your um, loading time if you optimize it to that level by, by a little bit. All right, so that's that. And you can see, yeah, sure. Uh, if you optimize the, the build time to rebuild the, the complete uh, image, but it would not have an impact on the target size of what you deploy when you push this image to uh, production. Well, it, it would have a little. I mean, it actually, it doesn't change much on the build time because it has to rebuild the step and there's one additional thing to extract the layers out of the char. So it, it might actually increase the build time by a tiny bit uh, on the local execution side. But once you, once you push it to a Docker daemon or to a, to a deployed in a Kubernetes cluster, which is kind of a set of Docker daemons, um, on the first time, the entire image has to be loaded and then it will be cached. But um, when a new image gets deployed and you have that top layer as a, as a big layer of like 20 megabytes, not big, um, then Docker will always have to reload that layer which has a little latency. If it's only a few kilobytes, it will get less. I mean, of course, I'm not seeing a whole lot of point in that optimization, but those things can get bigger. And if they like, have layers of 200 or 300 megabytes with whatever the dependency charts you might have in there, um, it, might be, uh, it might be an optimization. All right, good, good question. Thanks very much. So the other thing I wanted to show is a chip. So with chip, you, I would basically just say Maven compile and then reference that plugin. And um, you can see here, if I can ever find my mouse again, um, this build job. So with that build job, um, it... Okay, I thought about it, it's, uh, because it says 13 minutes left here. That's uh, five more minutes? Yes. Five okay, 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 okay. Well, fortunately, those mechanisms are pretty fast when I, if, if they work as expected. So now I have basically just executed that Maven command and I did not have to specify anything else. And the, the build time, as we could see here, was 21 seconds. The interesting thing is this was not only the build time, this was also the build and push time. So if I look on my Docker Hub right now, um, well, this used to be a lot faster but <laughs> when I had more time. Okay, now that is <laughs> it's coming. Yeah, yeah, it's. Oh no! <laughs> okay, so did I lose my connection? That's impossible. Oh, come on. Okay, here it is. Um, so. This image said it was pushed less than a minute ago. So it wasn't only built, it was already also pushed to my, um, to my Docker Hub with only one command. And I didn't have, and if we look at that image now, so 
you will find it. Um, so you don't want to find it yet. I first have to. It, it doesn't deploy it to the local registry, so I have to say no. Yes, <laughs> pressure is up now. <laughs> So, yeah, if we look into the images, and we've, I can explain that now, but I can do it later. This image is flagged as 52 years ago, but that's the one I've just <laughs> built. Um, if I go into the history of that image, uh, 6FB, then you can see this Maven plugin has automatically split that char file as well, and without us needing to do anything on that side. Now, I'm just going to do the last one and invoke pack. And um, then I can explain on the way where that 52 years come from. Both chip and Paketo build packs will produce images with a very old timestamp. The reason for that is, is that if you build an image with Docker, and I'm, or I think it, it used to be that way, I'm not sure if, if it still is, then the actual timestamp of the build will walk into the image ID. So even if you do exactly the same build on a different point in time, you might be ending up with two different image IDs, which is not really great in terms of consistency. That's why Chip and Paketo specify one very old date in the past that applies to every image. So they always have the same build date information, and then the image IDs will be consistent. You can switch that off, um, but in, in turn, you will basically sacrifice the option um, to, um, to have the consistent builds then. Now, in the meantime, the pack command has run. Um, with this one, we, it also doesn't require any files, so it detected this is a um, Java application with Maven, requires a Tomcat, a Spring Boot, and so on. And then it will uh, find out, okay, this is Java 11. It will download the latest Java runtime, the Java development kit, or reuse it if it already has it. Um, and again, well, this is quite chatty. There's a lot of information here. Um, it will also come with an image, um, which is the one which is surprisingly 42 years old. So it's 10 years younger than the one from Chip. Um, but yeah, believe me, this file was not there before. I labeled it that way. So with that, I will probably come to an end. So maybe have room for one or two more questions. In case you want to play with that by yourself, Feel free to check out my repo. All the instructions are in there. You can easily reproduce it and figure it out by yourself. Sorry, I came in a bit of pressure with the time here because I really expected to have some... Well, I actually promised you one thing. There's source to image from Red Hat, which does about a similar thing, but I don't have graphics for it. So it's like a build mechanism similar to Pack, where you have to basically to specify your builder image, and then it kind of does a, a similar approach. I promise you, I will put it into my slides. I don't want to like neglect Red Hat here. What you're doing here is perfect. Obviously, I haven't cached it before, so now we're in the download mode again. But this will also change once you have invoked it uh, a couple of times. And yeah, with that, I would first of all say thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, we have one minute. <laughs> yes, please. With chit. Well, it has to be inside of the directory where you invoke it. That's like the build context that it takes. And then it puts it into the, into the file. I think probably there are some specific commands if you want to drag in external resources, but that's like the base version how it works. Anything else? Yeah, then I can make room for the next one. So you see, source to image works pretty fine as well. And um, yeah, with that, thanks a lot for listening. <laughs>